All right. Good morning. We want to welcome you to Havenwoods Baptist Church today. I'm excited to be in God's house today. Excited to see you. Excited to see some uh, guests with us today. If you are a guest, you do the honor and uh, fill out this guest card right here that's attached to your bulletin. And you can just drop it in the, uh, the little box back there with the cross on it where we uh, place our tithes. A few announcements today I want us to go through. We got no midweek services this coming Wednesday, November 24th. So we got no midweek services, no kids, no youth, nothing going on that night. Just take that time to spend with your family during Thanksgiving. Uh, we got a Christmas concert on December the 12th by a guy named Christian Davis. Uh, done country music, southern gospel. He's been touring for a long time. Brother Ricky's actually kept up with him. So uh, that morning, it's actually the same day as the uh, Watson Farms Christmas party. So that morning at church, he will be here in concert. Christian Davis, so uh, you don't want to miss that that morning. It's going to be a great time. And then that night, at 5 o'clock, we're going to have the uh, Watson Farms Christmas party. Always a good time there. And of course, we're having the... Oh, yeah, we have them? Let me see. Yeah, Ugly Sweater Contest. Who's going to win that this year? Who's going to bring an ugly sweater this year? Anybody out there? Anybody out there who just got sweaters that are ugly? You just going to bring those? Okay. So that's going to start at 5. That's going to go from 5 to 7 that night. Um, please bring party food and drinks for your family plus two people. So bring the food and drinks for your family plus two people that night. We're going to have a great time. Well, it's a good day to be in God's house today, man. It's a good day to worship the Lord. Every day we should lift our praises to Him because He is worthy. So we're going to pray and we're going to get started today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you to come into your house, to honor you. God, I thank you for every single person that's here today. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you accept our praise and honor and worship to you. So we lift it up to you today. We sing our praise to you, and we thank you for this time. Thank you for our families. Thank you for the cross. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us today as we worship? You know, in these crazy times that we're in, I still believe that God is on his throne and that he is coming back. And he's going to come back and he's going to set up his reign. He's already on the throne, but he's going to be known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever. So let's worship him today. Oh, it's so 
says, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, sing it out. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Thank 
Gina from the Curse of Oak Island. I uh, do get confused for him on occasion. Um, you know, I was going to bring a shovel up here and do a little pose like that. You know, he's got the mustache, a little bit longer goatee. I've got the full beard, so uh, there's a little bit of a difference. But about once a month, twice a month, I have somebody either ask me if I'm him or tell me, ask me if I know I look like him. So this is going out on social media with Facebook and YouTube. So if it gets to Rick, just let me know how you want me to respond when I'm confused for you. Uh, I had one woman years ago before I even knew who he was or knew about the show. They got very upset at me, actually got upset at Rick because I would not give her Rick's autograph because I didn't know who he was and then she kept saying Rick and I'm like, I have no idea who you're talking about. And she got very, very upset at Rick directed at me for not giving her Rick's autograph. So, uh, but no, I am not him. So, uh, I'm Ryan. So, <clears throat> but Brother Ricky loves this show and a lot of people here in the church love it as well and they watch it and they comment on it and everything like that. But Brother Ricky, if you are on his Facebook on Tuesday nights, he always roots for those people on the first of all column that they're going to find something tonight. He knows it, you know, he feels it. They're going to find something amazing or some big treasure and this is like every Tuesday night. And then I jokingly tell him I can't reveal any plot twist or anything that's going on that's going on with the show because I'm under contract and you know, things like that. I can't tell anything about any show secrets. But one day, hopefully, they will succeed in finding the big discovery. Maybe. Maybe. But who likes being on a winning side? Go ahead. Everybody likes being on a winning side? Now, it's fun to root for the underdog, and if you're looking at the Curse of Oak Island as maybe an underdog story of them trying to find something and look for something, we always, you know, we'll, we'll root for them. But a lot of times when we have our team that we want to root for, we like for them to win. We enjoy it when they win. In fact, in today's society, if you look at college football and the NFL, there's already talk about coaches. They haven't had the winning season. They haven't, you know, they've only won seven games instead of nine like was expected or whatever the, the count is. Same thing with NFL. And they start doing that coaching shuffle where they shuffle them around to different places. And, you know, the alumni, the fans, they like to win. They like to cheer for a winning team. But do we have the same expectation? when it comes to the church, to root for a winning team. <clears throat> when it comes to things spiritual, who do you root for? Now, who do you like to see succeed? And hopefully you said God and Christ for winning spiritual battles, but are you really rooting or are you just living? You know, some of you could not care less about Football. I won't make you raise your hands because it's, you know, I mean, this is the South, you know, so everybody likes football. But there are people that don't like or like don't necessarily root for football or watch sports or maybe of any kind. But when we do have a team, we like to cheer them on. There are times there are cliffhangers, and you can tell the sports fans because when you come in here on third on Sunday morning, and I'm guilty of this will be a little hoarse because we've been yelling too much. But we like looking at watching success and we like rooting for a winning team. But are you ready to be part of a winning team? Are you ready to be part of a winning team? If you've got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. And then we're going to look at something and we're going to read some verses in uh, Matthew 16. We're going to read verses 13 through 18. And we're going to read that. And then I'm not going to refer to any of the verses specifically the whole rest of the message. And you say, well, that's kind of odd to have this 
The reason why is that when I started putting this message together, I ended up developing two different messages that are combined, that, are, that, are, that go together, and the other one will, will come later. But this is the foundation verses for it. Matthew 16, verse 13. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Referring to himself. And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, here you have Jesus that's there, he's living, he's going, he's doing things, he's performing miracles, he's doing all this, and yet people think he's somebody else. Somebody think he's a prophet, he may be John the Baptist, you know, they're not, they're not sure. When you see things in your life that God is doing and God's working on, who do you say Jesus is? give the glory back to God for what he's doing in your life, or do you think it's something else that's going on? Some other reason that's happening. Continue in verse 15. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? Well, here's where the rubber meets the road. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. I can just imagine Peter sitting there saying, I know, I know. Call on me, God. Call on me, Jesus. I know, I know. He said, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjana, because the flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who was in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Now he was not saying he was going to build this, the church based on who Peter was. What he's saying is he calls Peter, whose name means rock, but then the next part, that the word that he uses to describe rock in Greek means that the foundation is going to be the foundation of Christ, who's known as the rock. And that's the other part of the, of the message that uh, we're not going to get to today. But from reading this, we can learn one important lesson when it comes to winning. The church is invincible. The church is invincible. See, anything God has his hand on, yeah, excuse me if I fall off of this today, but it, anything that God has his hand on, it's going to succeed. Just like every one of us in this room that are just a child of God, we are immortal until God gets finished with us and calls us home. Because God has a plan, he has your hand, his hand on your life, and you are immortal until he is through with you. Now there are times that we say people were taken too early. They died too young. But God had a reason for it. Something we may not ever totally understand. But God had a reason for it. So when God is involved in the situation. And it says upon this rock Christ that hears it. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. We have Christ saying, my hand is on the church. Christ is saying, the church is built on me. But what is church? You look around, we're meeting in the gym because of some things that happened to, in the sanctuary through some storms last year and you know, some other situations that's happened. So we're meeting in the gym. Is this church? Make your head, say yes, okay, it's okay. We can speak out Sunday morning, I know, but you can speak out, that's all right. This is church. See, church is not a building. Church isn't four walls and a roof. And hopefully a couple of doors so you can get in and out. Church is the people. And church is called a household and a temple. That's your point one on, on your outline. Church is called a household and a temple. Have you ever wondered why God refers to things the way he does? In the Sunday school lesson today, I think I've got a, a question for the teachers to ask. So y'all can go ahead and be thinking about this. Why did God design the church the way he did? Why is it the church? Why do we come to a building? 
four walls and a roof that gets underutilized because it's used basically most of the time three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday afternoon, or Wednesday night. But we have a church, we have a church building, we have a temple. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, it says, so, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. But on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ and Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built up into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So here we have actually three different analogies of what the church is. And the first part of it is says that you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The household of God. Now we got Thanksgiving coming up in a few days. There's going to be family get-togethers and things like that. And, and y'all go have family. Y'all don't have to show your hand. But do you go to family get-togethers and there's always some kind of drama? Yeah. Yeah, okay, some people are actually showing their hands. Okay. There is drama at these things. It happens, it's, it, it, you know, it, it's family. And you have these dramas, like, well, I can't believe so-and-so brought salad. I was supposed to bring salad, and they brought salad. Or I brought this casserole, and so-and-so, and, so, and so, that's my casserole that I'm supposed to bring, so they're not supposed to bring it. Yeah, 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 it goes on and on and on. There's all these things that happen in, in the family, in, in the household. Now, I'm sure that when y'all grew up in, in your families, all the siblings just got together, got along wonderfully, right? No strife, no fighting, no tattletaling on each other, nothing like that. But in Ephesians, Paul uses the example, he says that we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. See, being in the household of God is different than being in our households that we grew up in and we have here. Because God's in charge. When we let him be in charge. Sometimes we want to do things on our own. When we try to do things on our own, what happens is that we have the siblings fighting. We have the tattletales. We have this. We have that. We don't actually all get along like we should. Later on in the verse, it Paul says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now look, that, that word grows means it has an action attached to it. In other words, it's not something that once you're saved and you come in there, boom, you're finished being the temple of God. It says that you grow into the temple of God. See, Christianity is not a one-time event. It's a lifelong experience. Because once we are saved, we have the responsibility of growing into the child that God wants us to be. We have the responsibility of growing into the fellow Christian that God wants us to be, to help others. And then it goes on later in the verse. It says, in whom also you are being, verse 22, in whom also you are being built together into a dwelling place by the Spirit of God. So Paul goes in and he takes it from looking at being a household, which is usually a smaller uh, unit, uh, you know, group of people, to a temple, which is a much larger, which is what we have here, like a, a, a church. Then he takes it back into being just the person itself by saying, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for, for God by the Spirit. Do we look at, as, as Christians, do we look at our, what we are as being the dwelling place of God the Spirit? Do we think, okay, I'm going to go do this, and oh, by the way, I'm taking God the Spirit with me. I'm going to go over this, or hey, I'm driving on Airport Boulevard, and that person just cut me off, but... Do we realize that God's Spirit's there right there with us? I don't. I forget, you know, a lot of times I forget about that because of my, 
emotions take over, my humanity takes over, and I forget. But God the Spirit is with us. It goes from a household family unit to a church unit to Paul saying, hey, you yourself. And that leads us to the next part. He said it's called a body. The church is called a body. So we go from a household and then or a temple or and a temple to a body. And Romans 12 through 14, uh, excuse me, Romans 12, 4 through 5. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go back to Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. It says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, the passage that we had before was Ephesians 2. And Paul continues on with this same theme because he ended verse 22 of chapter 2. was saying, in whom you were being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And then he picks it back up in chapter 4. and says to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. From whom the whole body, verse 16, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In love. Very important part of that right there. But if you look at the verse here, these verses, and Paul is talking about, you know, Christ is here, he's, he's coming in, and he's giving us God, the Holy Spirit. He wants to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. Now, some of us are older than some of the others in here. The young kids may not be able to relate to this, but you know, the older you get, there's a, I sometimes call it the, the chorus that I sing every morning, and it's the moans and groans just trying to get out of bed. Because everything hurts, or most everything hurts. We got that, that you know, we, we grow and we get old and our body doesn't respond the way that it's supposed to. I was up yesterday for those of, uh, that know the you know, gun season for deer opened yesterday and I was up with my future son-in-law. We were hanging stands and one of them was a tall ladder. I was climbing up and down that ladder. And I got done and I thought, Man, I don't know if I can, I can hunt in this stand this year if I have to keep climbing up and down this ladder all, all the time. But our bodies, you know, we go through changes as we get older. Do we go through changes as we get older in Christ, in Christianity? Do we mature as Christians? Or do we stay the same? Do we share the experiences? One of the, the key things that we have a responsibility to do here as a church, especially for us older people, is to teach the younger people to take our place. That's something that we lack a little bit in the church today, in my belief. I've challenged my Sunday school class people to find somebody or a, a couple of people younger than them to mentor take their place. See, so many times what happens is you get involved in the church and you do a lot of things and you've got you know, your responsibilities, things that you do. Then something happens and you can't do it and everybody's scrambling to find somebody to take your place. When we have a job that we do, something that we're called to do in the church, it's up to us to find somebody that can fill in for us or eventually take our place, especially the older we get. What's going to happen, and this is what it's talking about here, is it says in verse 16, it says, From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which is equipped. See, God has something for everybody out there. Somebody that's here that's younger than I am, younger than what Caleb is, younger than what Tim is, is going to be called to fill in the, in the pulpit up here when Brother Ricky's out. See, so it can't always be the same people. Because as a body, you have to sit there and work together. Now, I'm older. I've had my knee replaced. I'm glad I did. 
took me a while to really be glad that I had my knee replaced because recovery was not fun. Uh, the, the people that do the physical therapy, Spanish Inquisition's got nothing on them. You know, they'll sit there and they'll do stuff to your, to your knee, but it benefits you later. That's what happens with the body. Something hurt, and then it has to be, you know, you have to sit there and work on it. And it says when each part, in verse 16, when each part is working pro properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And there's that word grow again. See, Christianity is, again, it's a growth. It's not something that once you get saved, then you're done. You have to continue to develop, to, to continue to do things that God has for you. And then Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, it says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one with another. See, as being part, being a Christian, being part of the body of Christ, we all have different functions. Some of you would never dream about standing up here and filling in for Brother Ricky. I never dreamed about standing in front of everybody and filling in for the pastor when, when, when asked. But it happens. But the body, have you ever wondered why the body is made like it is, why God designed it like it is? Wouldn't it be fun or better, maybe easier, if instead of having the eyeballs up here where they, they have to see and as you get older, you know, you have to bend over and you know, you've got bifocals and everything like that. What if we had a, a, an eyeball on our finger? Look around. You can see in crowds, you know, if you're in a, in a parade, you can just lift your up, you can see. Something's lost under the bed, you just do this, you know, you can see it and find it, you know. You know, you know there are a lot of things that we might think about doing differently. But just like God designed our body the way he did, with the function that he, that he did, he's designed the church the same way. It's not a mistake, it's not coincidence that you were all here today. It's not a mistake, it's not a coincidence that you are part of the local church of Havenwood. God has brought all of us together to function as part of, his, of the body of Christ. But what is the purpose of the church? You know, we looked at what is church, and in Sunday school we're going to discuss you know, why, the, why the church. But what is the purpose of the church? Point one under this, this is, is to build up each other. One of the purposes of the church is to build up each other. It's also to minister to each other. And then thirdly, it's to meet together. So the purpose of the church, one of the purposes is to build up each other, to minister to each other, and to meet together. Now, how do we build up each other? If you are not going to Sunday school, I would recommend you go to Sunday school. If you're not involved in a small group, get involved in a small group. That part there which says to build up, that takes place in Sunday school. That takes place in a small group. When you are shared together, when you sit there and you talk, and you look at the lesson, and you, and you talk through things, one of the, the I don't know if you, one of my styles of teaching, I guess, when we do Sunday school and the people that are here that, that are in my class can attest to, I like to ask questions. Why this? What about this? And then I'm just quiet because I'm going to, no matter how asleep they are, I'm just going to wait till they wake up and answer, you know. So when we have that chance of them answering the question, it helps me out and it helps each other out. Because, see, we build up each other. There are so many times where it talks about that we need to, that second point, we need to minister to each other. There was a time, and this is not anything that's unique or special about, about our class that, that we have, but one of our members, something that happened in a family, in their family, and we wanted to take them a meal. So we just said, hey, look, we're going to take a meal, let's go ahead and get some money. Within about five minutes, 
we had pulled enough money together to not only buy them a meal, but then another church, another family in the church was hardly even able to buy them a meal as well. That doesn't speak to the people of the class. It speaks to their heart to want to help others, to want to do things to, to minister to each other. We can minister to the unsaved as well to show them what Christianity is like. And then thirdly in there it says to meet together. That is so important that we meet together, whether it be on Sunday morning, and I know we've got a Facebook and YouTube channel that goes out, but getting people into their local church where they can be built up, they can minister to someone or have someone minister to them, but meeting together so important. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 27, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In other words, when Christ comes back, we're going to, as Christians, we're going to all be together in heaven. So let's go ahead and start meeting together locally. Let's start going ahead and ministering to each other. Let's go ahead and start building each other up. You know, there are things that when you do a small group and you do a Bible study, you sit down and you have a discussion. And then, it, you know, the first week it's usually the teachers that are, that are there, the ones that are leading the small group. And then after a, a, a second week or third week, more people start coming and start contributing. They're building each other up. See, it's just as much in a small group or in a student school, it's just as much your part to contribute to the lesson as it is the teacher or the person that leads. And then another purpose of the church is to be a witness to the world. To be a witness to the world so that they can become part of God's kingdom. To be a witness to the world so they can become part of of God's kingdom. What kind of witness do people see from us? What kind of witness do, are people seeing from us on day to day? Now, you may say, well, you know, I'm a little hesitant about that. I, I can't really talk to people. Um, I'm not really that, that um, good at, at, at conversations or I'm shy or this or that. Once you tell somebody that you're a Christian, your life is a witness. Everything that you do reflects on your testimony. Everything that you say in conversation reflects on your testimony. So our job, one of our jobs in Acts 20, in Acts 2, 46 through 47, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. See, they were fellowshipping and they were getting saved because their life was a witness. And if you notice here, it doesn't say this in Acts, if you ever read through the, the Acts, what the Holy Spirit was doing. But either over there in, uh, in Israel, where this was taking place, either those people were Southern or they were Southern Baptists. Because if you look here, it says they were breaking bread in the homes. And anything that the Baptists know how to do, the Southerners know how to do, is break bread in the homes and get people in, in there for meals and, and things like that. And it says they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. So you have an opportunity for two things coming up December 12th, I think it is. We have a concert that morning. Have you invited anybody yet? Have you thought about inviting? You say, well, I just found out about it. Well, have you thought about somebody to invite? And then we have the uh, Havenwood's Christmas party that same evening at Watson Farms. Have you going to invite somebody to come? What a great time to have somebody come and see, see the church represented by having fun, food, and fellowship. 
three F's of the Southern Baptist Food Fund and Fellowship. Hopefully not in that order. But we do sometimes equate food with, with being priority there. But why did God set up the church the way he did? See, God could come and just say, you know, I'm just going to appear. I'm going to just make a proclamation and people will come to me. But God said, no, I want to use individuals. I want to use people. I want to have them function together like a household, like a home. I want them to realize that they are a temple that I inhabit their body to God the Holy Spirit. Because I want them to go out, I want them to build up each other, I want them to minister to each other, I want them to meet together, and then I want them to witness. See, that's why God set up the church the way He did. It's for His glory, but it's for our blessing. If you don't, if you've never gotten a blessing from from God, one, think long and hard about that and, and pray about it. But if you have the opportunity to build somebody up, somebody's hurting, you go and you hug them. You go and you talk to them. You sometimes realize that the, thing, the reason that something happened to you two years ago, four years ago, 20 years ago, is for you to minister to somebody in the future because they're going through the same exact thing. Sometimes things happen and we have the opportunity to make a comment to somebody and it may just be a, just a comment. But somebody says, you know what? That really ministered to me. That comforted me. And you're thinking back like, what did I say? Well, maybe you didn't say anything. Maybe God did. He just used you. That was my... He just, used, he just used you to make that comment for somebody. See, the church is God's. It is for his purpose. And it is the only winning team to be on, much less the only one to cheer. So if you like a winning team, and most of you were shaking your heads when I asked that question earlier, the church is the winning team to be on. It's the only winning team to be on. This is the way God has designed for us to be and to operate. And in today's society, there is a defeatist attitude. If you don't think so, watch the news. You know, they have to actually now on the news, they actually have a special segment of good news. Because on a 30-minute broadcast, 27 and a half minutes or you know, 97% of it's going to be devoted to something bad, and then 1 to 3% is going to be devoted to something good. It's a defeatist attitude in today's society. It's all doom and gloom. This is going to kill you. That's going to kill you. Don't eat eggs. No, eggs are good for you. you know, don't drink milk. Now there's a study out that whole milk is actually good for you. Imagine that. God gave us a cow, gave us milk, and Scientists for years have been telling doctors to tell us not to do it, and all of a sudden they're saying, oh, okay, well, maybe it really is good for you. There's all kinds of things out there where they want to do doom and gloom. Don't let it get you down. The positivity of being a Christian should far outweigh anything that the world presents to us. The, the positiveness of being a Christian should never be defeated by society. You should never have to worry about the things that God is doing in your life and God wants to do in your life. All it takes is surrender and say, God, use me the way that you want me, that you want me to. And one of the, the uh, songs that were sung says, I surrender all. And I was standing in the back and watching everybody sing. It says, all to Jesus, I surrender all. All to him I freely give. Did you sing it? Or did you mean it? I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. 
I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Do you? Verse 2 continues on, says, All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. Verse 3, which I was hoping you would sing, by the way, but that's all right. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. Verse 4, all to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessings follow me. You know that there is nothing in Scripture that I can find that God gives us that he tells us to hold on to. There's nothing in Scripture that he ever gives us that says, here, this is yours, hold on to it. See, God gives us love so that we can love others. God shows us grace so that we can show grace to others. God has mercy on us so that we can have mercy on others. There's nothing that he gives. He gives us a blessing. He wants us to pass it on to somebody else, to bless somebody else. Everything that he gives us, that's part of what it is to be a church, to be part of the church. The church is invincible because of who we belong to. In 1 Corinthians 13, 16 through 17, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. You are that temple. God wants you to realize that as his temple, you are representing him. You know, just like the moon reflects the sun, as Christians, we're supposed to reflect the Son of God. We're supposed to show forth who God is. So, our feet to faith today. Live your life like you were playing for a winning team, and you were playing or living your Christian life to win. Live your life like you were playing for a winning team and you were playing or living your life, your Christian life, to win. Do not have a defeated attitude. Do not let the world get you down. Realize who you are as Christian, as a Christian, so that you can be what God wants you to be. You know, the, the slogan for the army used to be, be all that you can be. Well, God's had that slogan for us as a church, as Christians, as his children, for forever. He wants us to be all that we can be in him. You have the opportunity, whether you want it or not, to be a witness. Because if, once you say that you're a Christian, they're going to sit there and, and look at you and know, that they should know that there's something different about you. What kind of church are you showing them? When you profess to be a Christian, when you talk about your faith, when you talk about what you did on Sunday, what kind of church are you showing them? As we close today, some of you may not be a part of the church. Maybe you won't be part of the but Some of you are not part of the body of Christ. If you'd like to come forward and talk to me about that, I'd be glad to, to talk to you. You know, we sang the song about, um, according to John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't say anything about going through these, this trial or you have to pass this test. It says, no, you have to believe. There's a free gift that's been given. You just have to accept it. And as Caleb leads us this morning, if you want to come talk about being part of this church, or come and be part of um, the body of Christ before the talking to you. You sang this today.